a revolution is taking place on the shore of the Caspian Sea. A new nation is joining the global economy. This sea and the riches under it belong to Azerbaijan. I've come to see what happens when a small poor nation becomes a player in the most global commodity of all. Globalization is going to work anywhere, it must surely work here. Zapach, yes? Yeah, Zapach, it's got the smell. It smells like petrol. Yeah. Looking at this kind of filthy looking stuff, it's hard to believe this is the purest oil produced in the former Soviet Union. And it was this that fueled the Soviet space program and put cosmonauts in orbit. In Baku, Azerbaijan's capital, the 21st century oil industry has arrived. The country is sitting on at least $80 billion of oil reserves, a fortune to a nation with the population of London. All the big oil companies are here, and Baku is booming. Azerbaijan has signed up to the big idea of our time, open up to the forces of international capitalism, trade and compete in the global market, and everyone will be better off. This $180 million rig is being built with money from around the world and an international labor force. How much more time will you be building? Some more one month. Some more one, one, month. one month and then, yeah. and then yeah. Madras, yeah. and then Madras. No, Madras, we are going to Singapore. Singapore, Singapore. Singapore yeah. after that, and build another rig. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. But you don't have to go far out of Baku to see that things are not going according to plan. Since the breakup of the Soviet Union, Azerbaijan has actually got poorer. The average wage is now around $40 a month. The town of Sumgait was an industrial powerhouse in Soviet times. This gargantuan factory was just one of many. It employed 2,000 people, now it employs 80. But in order to visit this factory, I had to go to the, uh, had to go to the local authorities in Sumgait and go through quite a convoluted procedure in order to be allowed inside. And even here, I've got a lot of minders who are watching where I'm going and what I'm looking at. Little sign of the global revolution here. This factory used to produce 70% of the equipment for drilling in Siberia, for drilling oil wells. Um, I, I've been told I'm being taken to some part of the factory which is still working, but I haven't actually seen any signs of life here whatsoever. I think there are more people showing me round the factory than working in it. Factories in Azerbaijan are only producing one-fifth of what they did in 1990. Here in Sumgait, United Nations officials told me factory bosses and politicians had blocked plans to pump in foreign investment because they didn't want to lose control. It seems they earn millions of dollars in backhanders selling the little they still make out the back door. Azerbaijan was turning out to be a cautionary tale of what happens when global capitalism falls foul of the local rules of the game. In private, the word I kept hearing was corruption. According to the World Bank, it's one of the key obstacles to development around the world. The difficulty here was finding anyone who would talk about it on camera. 
I just got tipped off that a uh, former major in the Azeri army has taken the unusual step of going public with allegations of corruption in the armed forces. So I've come along to the press club to see what he has to say. Major Alec Per Marmedov worked as an assistant to three defence ministers. He called this news conference to expose corruption he said was destroying the armed forces. In theory, there's a free press here, though journalists sometimes end up in prison. Alec Per said that the present defence minister steered lucrative contracts towards his friends. Most shockingly, he claimed that these Azeri soldiers starved because the money for their food went into the pockets of officials. It was an extraordinary story. I arranged a rendezvous. He's saying that until 1999, he... he he was sort of carrying out this internal campaign to expose corruption. He was doing it secretly, and he went public in 1999. He's saying then, it was, once he'd gone public, he gave an interview to a newspaper, then uh, he, he received threats and uh, telephone calls. Yeah. He's saying that he's, they put you under observation, he thinks we're um, under observation right now. But the vitamin E, he's saying that, he's saying that uh, people are either afraid or they have some kind of personal interest for not speaking out. Alec Pear wanted to show me his flat so I could see how people in Azerbaijan live if they don't take bribes. These are, um, those are Alec Pear's daughters up in his apartment there, and he gave them their military haircuts. His family of five all sleep on the floor of this room. It's hot and full of mosquitoes. He shaved his daughter's heads to prevent lice. Bathroom. He's, there's no door because he hasn't got enough money to replace it. If we don't go, he's saying I'm not a refugee, but <laughs> this is where I live. <laughs> the evening news reported Alec Pear's press conference, but rubbished his story. When I contacted the defence ministry later, they were scathing about Alec Pear saying his real motive was to destroy morale in the armed forces. The Minister of Defence denied everything. I mean, the coverage has been pretty negative on TV and I wonder if he feels like it, it was worth it. Stoy it. You know, when I was there, I was in the front of me, there were two roads. There's two paths. That's one path led to a good life and taking bribes, right. and the other part is the part is he's on. Не пошел туда, а пошел вот сюда. He consciously chose this this path. The reason is the has to struggle is that if they don't make a stand now, the, this will become an unlivable place. Alec Pear had offered a glimpse of a system that was corrupt to its core. It fitted with what other people had told me, that in Azerbaijan, everyday life is dominated by corruption. Seeing a doctor, getting a child educated, everything needs a bribe. And I was about to learn why the many foreign businesses that leave Azerbaijan in despair never bother to fight corruption in the courts. <laughs> Adil Ismailov knows the legal system from the inside. A while ago, he used to work for the state prosecutor's office, and during that time, he did take bribes. No. 
более-менее нормально было. Так что становится хуже. Да. I was saying that Idol was saying that you know the situation in those days before '92 was a bit better because the state salary was worth more and prices were stable. And so I said that with prices uh, a bit higher and the state salaries worth a bit less, the situation must be getting worse. And he agreed. Пошел к суду, он клиент пошел к тебе, ты пошел к суду, он договорился, отдал деньги, что ты сделал. Uh, I was saying, you know, the thing is now even the judges accept bribes. The, the, the lawyers are almost useless. Ну судья получает 50 долларов тоже. Сказал клиенту, говорит, зачем тебе адвокат нужен? Ну что он тебе будет делать? He's, uh, I just said there was an incident where the judge just said to uh, the accused, what do you need a lawyer for? You know, you can give me the bribe yourself. Idil's a lawyer, and he's, uh, but he's actually doing consulting work now. And he told me a couple of other interesting things. He was saying that um, business was really good about a year ago, and now a lot of his foreign clients have gone away. They've just had enough. And he said uh, the people who are staying are just the ones who've accepted that they have to play by the local rules of the game. Every survey puts Azerbaijan among the most corrupt nations on earth. The policeman shaking down unlicensed traders on the street is where it begins, but it permeates the entire country. For much of the 1990s, the World Bank said corruption didn't really matter, but it's changed its tune. It now says corruption can choke the economic life out of a country. If anyone knows how the system works, it's this man. Hi, Paul. Hi, nice how to are meet you? you. Good. And you. Good morning. Paul Parvis personifies international business. An Iranian with a Portuguese passport who was educated in Britain and America, he's been running hotels in Azerbaijan for almost 30 years. A great deal of corruption comes. Under the communist regime, ownership was not permitted. All of a sudden, Communism collapses, you're allowed to own things. So what is the human tendency? <laughs> Grab. Right. They lived in little dinky apartments. They were only allowed so big. Now the guy has found, he's done some trading, found some money, he can buy a piece of land, he can build a house, so people are going crazy building a house. You either have to change the mentality of a 65-year-old bureaucrat who's been a communist all his life, he's come out of a Russian school, from communist school, turned him into capitalist. Boom. No. These people still read the newspapers and the system, what happens in Russia, they still copy it from them because that's what they've been familiar with. That's what they know. On the streets of Baku, unemployed teachers and former soldiers waited for casual work. Not much talk of the oil boom and the global economy here. They, they come here in the morning and they're here till 10 at night for 15 hours maybe and the people here still in the evening waiting for work. They all say if the factories were working they wouldn't be here. He said, uh, I said well, the, the oil is going to help you. He said uh, that oil doesn't concern us, we're slaves. He says he'll come straight and work with us, for, he, he'll come straight to England if we just make him out the forms. He said all the factories are closed. They're all being sold. He says a few people live like kings and the rest are poor. There are no kings in Azerbaijan, but the closest thing to one is this man, the president, Haydar Aliyev. His pictures and sayings are posted on walls and buildings throughout the country. Okay, the gates are opening. We're waiting for the uh, president to come out. The president agreed to see me at his country house, or dacha. The roads of the capital were cleared of traffic to allow his motorcade to pass. We've been driving for about 15 minutes from the president's residence towards his dacha, and every 30, 50 yards, there's been a policeman on both sides of the road. Uh, I was told there are 120,000 policemen in this country and uh, it feels like half of them must be out on the streets of Baku today.
We're stopping at a, uh, a market, a bazaar outside the town, uh, and then the president is going to do a walkabout. An ex-KGB general and a former Politburo member, President Aliyev ruled Azerbaijan when it was a fiefdom of the Soviet Union. He became leader of independent Azerbaijan in 1993. President Aliyev constantly attacks the culture of corruption, but he's ruled the country for a total of 17 years as a communist and now as a free market democrat. Corruption is as bad as ever, and some say worse. Don't worry, he told his audience. Azerbaijan will develop day by day. You will live an excellent life. Whoa, here we go. And we're in. This is the president's dacha. Hello. After being introduced to the president's granddaughters, I wasn't sure how much time we'd have with him. I thought I'd better start the interview as soon as possible. But uh, Azerbaijan still has a tremendous problem with corruption, and I wonder if you ever worry that um, this will spoil your achievements. But in Azerbaijan, there is also a lot of corruption. Uh, you uh, have you started the interview? <laughs> yes, I have, if that's, if that's too soon. <laughs> well, why don't we first discuss how we're going to manage this interview? Are we going to do it like uh, here? Huh? <laughs> 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 the president took me to a guest house set aside for state visitors to continue our discussion. In these lavish surroundings, I prepared to return to the subject of corruption. But naturally, there is a corruption in some society, in some parts of our society. This is a common disease. But after a bit of prodding, he went much further. If I'm, I understand correctly, the president is saying that if everyone who had ever taken a bribe lost their job, the country would simply become ungovernable. Partly that is correct. But uh, I don't have a trust or belief that those who replace to the persons whom I fire won't be also getting bribes. Maybe I would fire all of them. The president said the government had earned $800 million so far from the oil industry, and there was much more to come. Um, do you ever worry that corruption will prevent that money from trickling down and benefiting the ordinary Azeri people? All the oil wealth will go down to, the, to benefit the ordinary people. Because it is under the uh, government's control and personally under my control. We have created the oil fund. That fund reports directly to the president. No one can even take one dollar out of that fund and waste somewhere. That's a relief. No one can misappropriate the money. The president isn't going to let anyone else near it. President Aliyev had been disarmingly frank, but I still felt puzzled. He's been in office on and off since 1969, but he still throws up his hands and says there's nothing he can do about corruption. I wondered if the president sensed my doubts. He showed his grandson how to treat nosy foreign journalists. Hit him, he said, in the stomach. 
In every society, there's a group of people whose job it is to sniff out corruption. This bleak looking place has a lot of defunct oil refineries and old car plants here. The reason I've come is actually to meet a journalist who used to have his printing presses in this part of the city until they were closed down by the government. Elmar! Elmar Hussainov found himself out of a job after he wrote an article criticizing the president. Is this? This is uh, Elmar's old place of work. This was the uh, typographic press. Tax officials sealed the premises the same day that Elmar published an article questioning the president's achievements. Okay. Yeah. It's quite a medieval looking thing. On the 6th of May, this magazine appeared. And at 11 o'clock in the evening, at night, uh, the authorities came along to close this down and close down the, uh, the office. Dverie. He, he says it's called democracy of the closed doors. Outside, a jeep full of police were waiting for us. Salam. We bumped into them again when we walked towards a nearby cafe. They were worried that Elmar had broken the seal on the printing presses and started work. He told them they were an embarrassment to their country. Sixty miles out, in the middle of the Caspian Sea, is a place that epitomizes Azerbaijan's Soviet past. But Azeris worry that if corruption chokes off their chances of joining the global economy, this might also be an image of their future. This is oily rocks. In Stalin's time, it was a Soviet showpiece, 120 miles of roads and oil rigs built on stilts. Look, this is the view from the window of Hotel Oily Rocks. Nothing works properly here. Parts of it are crumbling into the sea. The whole rust bucket's an embarrassment to the government of Azerbaijan. But oily rocks is what I'll remember most. For it seemed to me this is Azerbaijan's destiny if corruption continues to scare off foreign money and drive away homegrown talent. And I'm not the only one who thinks this. Be my guest. Rasul is 20. He's had enough. He's leaving for Europe. There is nothing here for the young and ambitious. And you were saying that, um, you know, five years ago, everyone was saying it's going to be fantastic in yeah. five years' time. They were saying that after five years, you will be like Kuwait, you know. It's everything. You will have everything here. You've got enough oil. Why aren't you Kuwait? Somebody's going to be rich, right? Yeah. Who? Who is rich at the moment? You think so? Yeah. I mean, the people who is rich in Azerbaijan, they're getting richer and richer. The people which is poor, they're getting poorer and poorer. Even. In a desolate railway siding outside Baku are people who are the poorest of Azerbaijan's poor. But they now stand for the poor of so many other countries. The families here live in railway carriages, refugees from a war with Armenia. They've been here seven years. The global revolution has brought them less than nothing. What you can't appreciate is that the inside of these things is uh, cast iron and it's what well, it must be 45 degrees, which is why they sleep underneath. Like many around the world, they would like to be part of the global economy but the new rules are failing them. They can't get a foot in the door, and if they miss out now, they will be sidelined forever.
Next week, Sonia Saul travels to Sao Paulo in Brazil, a city in the grip of an epidemic of violence and murder. It's been just about one hour since the first shotgun casualty came in this Saturday night with a bullet in his leg. Since then, there have been five people in, two dead on arrival, one paralyzed from the neck down. Unreported World explores more of the hidden cost of globalization next Friday on 4.